Today's topic is about mind control. Cue Twilight Zone music. When people think about mind control, a lot of things they think about are like brainwashing or people being forced to believe something. Uh, mind control is really different. I see mind control as something that's more subtle. You don't really notice it. But we're going to talk about this today because the reason why I start with mind control with Jehovah's Witnesses or any high control religion is because you must understand why they're so hard to talk to. <laughs> if you can understand mind control, you will understand the mind of the witness. Now, I know that this is going to be a long video already. I know because there's so much information. <laughs> But I mean, this is a very important topic. We're going to talk about a few ways uh, throughout this whole series on how you can penetrate that mind control, how to get past it. A lot of this information is out there for people to research. I have to give credit where credit is due and thank this man, Stephen Hassan. He used to be in the Mooney religion. I think they call it Unification Church. Um, it, it's a cult. And after he was deprogrammed from leaving the Moonies, he went and got a lot of fancy degrees and became a cult expert. And this is the book that I have read in preparation for this video. I'm mainly going to focus on what he calls the bite model, uh, which we will go over that later in this video. Also, other websites that have really helped me a lot with putting this information together uh, there's a lot of them. I will put these websites in the description of this video, a major one, and it's one of my favorite websites to refer to about Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's been around for a while, is jwfacts.com. It is a wealth of information. You will find a lot of this information that I'm going to share with you on their website. Another website that I always refer to and I really enjoy is a website called forjehovah.org. It's for people who are really trying to reach out to Jehovah's Witnesses. You can even get in contact with a lot of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses on that website and try to get a little bit more insight on how to witness to them and what the beliefs are of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I find mind control to be a very fascinating topic because we can see this in many aspects of our lives. It could be political, it could be religious, it could be within relationships. And I think it's crucial to go over this uh, before we really go over the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, to understand them and their mindsets. I'm assuming that most people that watch this video may not have a lot of experience with Jehovah's Witnesses and their teachings. I'm assuming that a lot of people that are watching this video are Christians who want to either learn more about Jehovah's Witnesses or maybe have a loved one that's, uh, you know, lost in the religion and you want to know how to reach them. I, I'm hoping and praying that this video is a great resource for you. And if you guys have followed me for any amount of time, I'm really passionate about understanding the position of the person you're trying to reach first. Because I think once you understand that and you have insight on where they're coming from, you then have a better way to reach them because you understand their language. You understand their mind language, if that makes sense. So to start off, I'm actually going to quote the Watchtower uh, in talking about mind control. You will see a lot of quotes in this whole series. You will see a lot of quotes in this video. Uh, I really want to back up the religious teachings that they have with what the religion actually says. So here's a quote. It says, we cannot claim to love God yet deny his word and channel of communication. Now this is a very telling quote because you can't love God yet deny his channel of communication. You can't love God and deny his organization. So before we start off with anything, right off the bat, understand that in the mind of the Jehovah's Witness, when you deny the organization, you're denying Jehovah God. They are one and the same. I'm also going to point out the definition of contextualization. Uh, some people might know what that means. Some people may not. It's a fancy word for aiding comprehension when spreading the gospel. So in other words, to contextualize what you're saying 
means to tailor your presentation of the gospel that's dependent on the ears that are hearing it. You're not adapting your message. You are contextualizing it. You're understanding your audience and the sociological context that they are in so they can understand what you're saying better. So let me give you an example of this. I have given this example before in a previous video that was talking about how the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, brought me out of the new age. It's a long story, uh, but I, I actually heard this example in college. I took a sociology class and I, I really loved this class. I learned a lot about the function of, of people and how they function in society and how the person is different than the people and all this stuff. In this class, my sociology teacher was giving us a lesson on culture and how in each culture in the world differs from one another and how what we might think is appropriate in our culture is not in another. So if you say something like, for example, handshaking might be completely off limits in one culture and even knocking on somebody's door might be an offense. Whereas in other cultures, you stay outside the fence and yell their name. And it's understanding the culture and the context of the society in which they live. Well, she was giving an example of soup, instant soup, in this little town in Italy. And it was a long time ago that I remember this. So I'm not sure of the specifics of where in Italy or anything like this, but Italians take their food very seriously. Well, here in America, we like instant soup. We eat it often. It's on our grocery shelves and we don't really think too much of it when we open a little packet of instant soup or a can and eat it. So there was an instant soup company here in America that decided to outsource. They wanted to go in other places in the world and sell their product. And they decided what better place than this little town in Italy? So they went and they tested this and, and gave away free samples of their product to people in this region. And people loved it. They ate it up. They thought it tasted delicious. So they thought, yeah, slam dunk. We're going to sell our product in this region and we're going to make millions of dollars and everything's great. So they did that. They put it on the shelves of the markets there and lost their shirts. It didn't sell hardly at all. They were completely baffled. So they wanted to get down to the bottom of this. What happened? Why, why did people love the way it tasted and they loved it? Uh, but then when they put it on on the shelf, virtually nobody bought it. What, what happened? They, I'm sure they hired a bunch of fancy people to go and do this research, but they did. They researched the culture that they were selling this item to. And they came back with some pretty interesting results. Turns out in this particular region that they were selling this instant soup in, the amount of time you spend making dinner for your family is a direct reflection of how much you love them. So think about that for a second. If you are making instant soup for your family for dinner and it takes, I don't know, a minute or two to make, and that's a direct reflection of your show of love to them, that's gonna be an insulting thing to your family. From what they understood, the families would spend hours making dinner for their family. It, it would be like half the day sometimes and they're, they're elaborate meals. And though it tasted good, nobody in their right mind in this region would buy the instant soup because of that cultural offense that it would make to everybody else. So I give this example because this is a backdrop to why we need to understand the culture of the witness. We're not gonna give them instant soup. We're going to actually look at what's more effective in reaching them. In order to do that, we must understand where they're coming from. We must understand their mind. Once you know how their mind works, you're gonna know a lot better of what not to do and what to do. I think a lot of people assume that Jehovah's Witnesses are just like any other denomination out there. 
they're not. They're tough cookies. They're hard to talk to. So with all that being said, we're going to delve a little bit more into mind control. In Steve Hassan's book, Releasing the Bonds, he explains that a Basically, the fancy word for mind control is coercive persuasion. This is also the same term that's used for brainwashing, though mind control is different than brainwashing. The first study that was done to show this and to demonstrate this was done by a man named Robert Lifton in the 1950s. This was when a lot of stuff was happening with communism. He specifically looked at Chinese communist techniques. And it was through that research that he saw a lot of constants. And it wasn't just in China. It's, these are techniques that are used almost everywhere in many different organizations in many different types of settings. Something interesting I also like to point out while talking about this is that we can kind of understand this more than we know uh, by looking at popular movies, for example. One example is 1984 by George Orwell. A lot of people have read this book. I love this book. I read it as a senior in high school. It was required reading and I'm so glad I read it. It really opened my eyes to how stuff like this can actually work. And granted it's fiction, <laughs> um, parts of it have strings of truth in it. If you have not read 1984 by George Orwell, it's a very good book. In other movies where you might see cultish or cult-like themes, believe it or not, is uh, I think Tangled, the movie Tangled, the Disney movie, because Rapunzel's told that the world is a certain way and there's a lot of fear tactics, there's a lot of unhealthy love given by Mother Gothel and I mean, if I, every time I watch this movie, it reminds me of the Jehovah's Witnesses, where Mother Gothel is the organization and Rapunzel's kind of like the witnesses that are just blindly following. But if you, if you try to leave, if you try to look out and see, wow, there's more out there, maybe they're wrong, then you're, you are definitely going to be shamed and you're going to be filled with fear. And I, I was really uh, shocked when I first watched that movie where I'm like, wow, Maybe one of the writers was an ex-Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> Another one is The Village because they're living under this world where they think that it's a reality. They think that that's really what's true. And their leaders are the ones that are kind of keeping them, you know, stuck in that world. And it's not until you get, you fight your way out, basically, that you find out it's all a big lie. So spoiler alert. Um, I, I've never seen this movie, but The Manchurian Candidate, I hear, is a like a cultish movie, and then The Truman Show. So those are just some examples to give you where you might understand how the locks work, what mind control kind of looks like. But we're going to go into a lot more detail about this. So moving on, we're going to look at some main indicators of mind control. A religion that's practicing mind control techniques has the power to manipulate humans to believe unrealistic doctrine and engage in destructive behavior. Here are some examples. Members of suicide cults and suicide bombers that sacrifice their own life and kill innocent members of the public. Parents that allow their child to die refusing medical treatments. Jehovah's Witnesses are known for refusing blood transfusions, which we'll get into later on in the series. Mothers and fathers are instructed to shun their own children or children that shun their parents and siblings for life due to a difference of opinion over religion or morals. Next is the leadership deserves strict, unquestioning obedience. There's a saying, and I posted it a few weeks ago on my Instagram. It says that there's problems with the religions that have all the answers is that they don't allow questions. So a Jehovah's Witness will tell you, oh yeah, we ask questions. We're allowed to ask questions, but you're only allowed to ask certain questions. You don't question authority. That's a big no-no with Jehovah's Witnesses. You do not question your leaders. That is questioning Jehovah himself in the mind of the witness. So you blindly follow, but they will not think of it like they're blindly following their leadership because they trust their leadership. If you can convince anybody that you hear from God, then they're gonna believe anything you say. They're gonna believe everything you say. They're gonna trust that what you are saying is from God. So as long as that trust is there, then what you're saying in that leadership is gonna be received. 
by the people underneath you who trust what you're saying because you have convinced them that you're hearing from God. And because you hear from God, you shouldn't question them. You're questioning God himself then as a result. How dare you? Another one is that people and groups that are under mind control believe that they alone are unique in teaching truth. They alone have the truth. You are on the outside. They are in the, on the inside. They have special revelation, special knowledge, and you're outside of that, which means you're less than, you're not as spiritual as they are. You do not have the truth. They have the truth. You don't. And it's very black and white. It's very us versus them, which we'll get into that a little bit later. Salvation is only possible through association with the group. You must go through the religion to be saved versus Jesus alone to be saved. So all the saving actions of Jesus are put on the back burner because the religion or the group or the organization, in this case, the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower, steps in place of that saving action. Jesus is only part of it. As Christians, as people who read the Bible and study the Bible, even people who are not Christians can clearly read the Bible and see that this is the theology of Christianity, that it's through Jesus alone that we're saved. Jesus plus nothing, not Jesus plus anything. So to the mind of the witness, Jesus is part of it. It's Jesus plus the organization. You have to be a part of this organization to be real Christians. And they call it the truth, which we'll get into later on what that means to them. But to them, that's the truth. This is the truth of Christianity. And if you're not in it, then you're a part of Satan's world. So basically what the Watchtower says is you have to go through us in order to get to God. Instead of saying, oh, you have to go through Jesus to get to God, it's you have to go through the watchtower to get to God. They take the place of Jesus. Lastly, people who reject or leave the organization or religion or group are to be strictly shunned. Now, a Jehovah's Witness will say that they don't shun. They do. It's just a different term that they use. And when I say shun, you guys, I'm talking like you don't exist. <laughs> they it doesn't matter if it's your child. It doesn't matter if it's your husband. It doesn't matter if it's your best friend. If they leave the religion or if they're disfellowshipped, which, which means that they are kicked out for some reason um, or another, which we'll get into what some of those reasons are later, you are to be shunned. This is a very strong psychological hold to keep you in the group because if you leave, you are leaving everything and everyone you know. A lot of people stay because their loved ones are in the group, not because they necessarily believe, but they would rather have their families um, than be shunned and be completely isolated. As we get more into doctrine, we will find out why they believe that and just a little bit more of the teachings that the organization holds on this topic. So this is the basic overview of things that we find in high control groups that practice these kinds of things. I am going to talk a little bit more about Stephen Hassan because his work is monumental for people who are trying to learn about those that are under mind control and in high control religions. So for those of you who are wondering about who he is, some people might know who he is because they maybe look into this stuff. His whole goal is to do this research to help people understand the mind of people that are in cults. So he specializes in this stuff. He does have a lot of good information on here. I'm going to read some excerpts from uh, part of his book that I think would be very helpful in moving forward. Now I'm going to look at chapter four and I'm going to read part of it to you because I think it's important to understand how and why people join cults. How, did, how does this happen? And for people who are wondering, is Jehovah's Witnesses a cult? It's a strong word. I get that. But yeah, <laughs> in this aspect, because of the mind control techniques and tactics that are used, yeah, they definitely would fall under the category of a cult. But in regards to people being susceptible to joining these high control groups, this is what he says. 
most people would like to believe that they are in complete control of their mind at all times. But it is precisely this belief in our own invulnerability that allows cults to entrap unsuspecting recruits. There are three primary reasons why intelligent, educated people with stable backgrounds can be drawn into cults. First, there's a persuasive lack of awareness about cults and mind control, which is why I'm starting with this video, by the way, <laughs> when it comes to this topic. Second, many situations make people more vulnerable to recruitment. For example, a person whose parents have recently separated or divorced will be more likely to listen to a recruiter who describes his group as one big happy family. Someone whose romantic relationship or marriage has just ended will be more susceptible to come-ons by an attractive person. Other common variables include death of a loved one, illness, loss of a job, graduation from high school or college, and moving to a new location, city, state, or country. Situational vulnerabilities occur in everyone's life. It is easy to see how people tend to be more vulnerable to an attractive recruiter offering community, love, and meaning during such episodes. A lot of the people that join the Jehovah's Witnesses do have some sort of emotional need of some sort. Some people are looking for truth. They're seeking God. They really do want to know more about spiritual things. And lo and behold, here comes a Jehovah's Witness who seems to have all of the answers. And we'll go over more of their strict routine and how they can just spit out answers left and right, because they're so highly trained in what they believe. They know what they believe. And there's a saying that they'll get you in a doctrinal chokehold. If you do not know your Bible, they really will put up their spiritual dupe, so to speak, and really challenge what you believe because they are drilled. If you are born in the Jehovah's Witness religion, you are drilled from the time you are young into what the religion teaches, what the watchtower says, and that they have the truth. And that if you're outside the truth, you're going to die at Armageddon, which I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But just keep that in mind, that the reasons why people join this religion is that they do seem confident sometimes in what they believe. And I think that's attractive to some people. On another note, also, uh, a lot of this does apply to Mormons, LDS. <laughs> you guys have heard me say this before, and I will always say this. I just, I love Mormons. I love LDS people. Um, but a lot of them will even admit that they know that there's lots of issues with the church. They, to some degree, even some of them will admit they know it's not true, but they still stay. And the reason why they stay is because of the community that the LDS have. They have a very strong sense of family and community. And to them, that is worth staying. So continuing reading um, in chapter four, I have a feeling a lot of people will resonate with this particular paragraph that I'm about to read because I think a lot of people can understand how we would look to fill a certain void if we have uh, certain things that would make us more vulnerable to deception, um, whether it be getting in a bad relationship, a toxic relationship, a toxic religion, whatever the case may be. This is what he says. Finally, some individuals have psychological profiles that make recruitment easier for cults. In general, people who have difficulty thinking critically will be easier targets. People pleasers who seek the approval of their peer group out of insecurity and anyone with low self-esteem will be more vulnerable to the peer pressure exerted by the cult recruiters. Individuals with learning disorders, drug or alcohol problems, unresolved sexual issues, pre-existing phobias, and other unresolved traumatic issues will also be easier targets. Cults seek out such vulnerabilities and use them against recruits, often making grandiose claims that their group will solve all of the person's problems. Now, this is, this is really key because I find this, this particular thing I find across a lot of religious institutions in general because I, they try to take the place of God. I know that sounds weird, but in the Watchtower in particular, to narrow the focus here, you are promised happiness if you join Jehovah's organization. Now, it's never just Jesus, okay? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus alone fills that void. So for a little while, you're going to find comfort. For a little while, you're going to find uh, 
acceptance. And this goes for anything. It could be any kind of group that you're going to feel really good at first. I, it's, I call it the honeymoon phase. And whatever new thing it is, it's, oh, it's shiny, it's new, and you're there. This is why Jesus says he's the bread of life. This is why he's the living water. Because when you follow him, when he's your everything, then you, you thirst no more. You hunger no more spiritually. And I think that's such a key point to make because Jehovah's Witnesses fill their void through religion, their religion, and their religious works. You got to do so much. And then you never know if you're good enough. You never know if you're going to be surviving Armageddon. I mean, it's uh, the guilt and the fear is uh, paramount. And we'll get into a lot of the guilt and the fear later on in this video. Uh, Stephen Hassan, he writes this in his book. Uh, he basically has something called the BITE model. And it's easy to remember. BITE is an acronym. And each letter stands for something different. The B stands for behavior control. I is information control. T is thought control. And E is emotional control. We're going to go over each one and how it applies to the watchtower. The BITE method is a simple way to test if a group is engaged in persuasive coercion and mind control. Now he did adapt this from another expert's research. Um, there is a lot more in his book about the ins and outs of all of this, but I, I think that it's rather kind of genius, if you will, that Hassan made the bite model because it simplifies what types of things happen in these high control groups to get the outcome, the desired outcome of their followers. All right, so let's go over behavior control in the Watchtower Society. So the Watchtower Society has an intricate set of standards, of rules that's not specified in the Bible, but is very unique to the Watchtower. Things like your hair. So you, you have to be well kept. There is no beards. Beards are seen as worldly for the most part. Uh, your clothing. They are dressed to the nines every Sunday when they go to their kingdom hall. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness woman and you're walking into the kingdom hall every Sunday, your dress better not be above your knee. You are a Jehovah's Witness. You represent Jehovah. The length of your skirt better be acceptable, as well as everything else that should be acceptable. There are no tattoos. The movies that you're watching should not be anything that's worldly music they don't and this this might surprise a lot of christians but we'll get into what why this is as we get into more of their doctrine but they don't listen to christian music that's worldly that's satanic if you are a jehovah's witness and you are listening to christian music of any kind you are seen as a weak jehovah's witness this is a no-no because the songs they're singing about jesus which is not okay they should it's all about jehovah and you're idolizing Jesus, and that's weird to a Jehovah's Witness. But they don't listen to any Christian music. They actually think that we're in Satan's system, like we are in Satan's world. So as me being a Bible-believing Christian outside of the organization, they would view what I do and what I have to say as being basically on the side of Satan. But I, I could go on about that, but I, I think it's, you know, another thing that the watchtower emphasizes to help control their behavior. There is no gambling. There is no smoking, no political involvement at all. They don't vote. They don't run in politics. They don't do anything like that. They don't salute the flag. They stay away from that stuff. Holidays and entertainment are all dictated. Jehovah's Witnesses do not have, they don't celebrate any holidays, no birthdays, no Christmas, no Halloween, which some people might know them for that, but I mean, no Mother's Day, no Father's Day. Valentine's Day, nothing. It's all worldly and pagan. So it's important to point out that the Watchtower does dictate everything that the witness does. Who you hang out with, are, are they a Jehovah's Witness? Are they a good Jehovah's Witness? Are they worldly? Your association matters. This is, they, they call this bad association, which we'll get into more later, but who you associate with as a Jehovah's Witness does reflect on your standing in Jehovah's organization. So you better be hanging out with the right people. Hang out with other Jehovah's Witnesses that are in good standing and you're okay for the most part. Another thing that is really 
telling about high control groups is how rigid your schedule is. So for a Jehovah's Witness, the, the meetings that you attend each week and how many hours you have witnessing um, are considered acceptable and how to report it. So you should be spending more time with Jehovah. You should be spending more time going door to door. You should be spending more time witnessing to other people, uh, whatever the case may be. And what this does is that this creates a community. You have a sense of belonging and it's very strong because everybody else thinks like you. <laughs> so the witness feels very special. They feel like they're part of this wonderful, united organization. So they feel special for reasons that are not in the Bible. They feel special because they're a part of this organization. So the list goes on. So outside the physical reality of controlling how you look, who you hang out with, um, hairstyles, things like that, what you can do with your free time, and also the major time commitment and expectation to be involved with all the meetings, all of them. If you're not at the Kingdom Hall on Sunday, somebody's going to know, and they're going to call you, and they're going to check on you and wonder why you weren't there, and you better have a good excuse. The other thing is individualism is discouraged, and groupthink prevails. So what I mean by that is kind of like what I said before, I call this, I, I don't know if this is an appropriate term, but this is what it reminds me of is like religious communism. You're all the same. You all must agree. And there's not much room for disagreement at all. There is no free thinking. And they are actually very open about this. When I was, I, I've met with my Jehovah's Witnesses years ago, and I still keep in contact with some online. And they're very honest about this, that you, we should not be free thinkers. We should conform to what the watchtower says because free thinking is what got Eve in trouble. It had she obeyed, remember they see God and the, the watchtower is the same thing. Had she obeyed, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. So free thinkers, mm, that's bad. We should listen to everything the watchtower says. And groupthink let me just give you the definition of groupthink because this is, this is a good definition. The practice of thinking or making decisions as a group in a way that discourages creativity or individual responsibility. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. Groupthink. If you are that one person that says something that goes against the crowd, you're the black sheep. You know what it reminds me of now that I think of it? Kind of the end of Titanic when the ship was going down. I can't remember... Uh, the actress's uh, character, but Kathy Bates was the actress. She did an amazing job in this movie. And I don't, I'm not sure if everybody's watched this movie. So spoiler alert, the ship goes down. <laughs> but she was always kind of different than the people around her when it came to her humanity. So everybody is getting off the ship and they're getting in the lifeboats. And Kathy Bates' character is looking back at the ship going down and there's a whole group of people in this little tiny ship that's taking them to safety. Kathy Bates character is like, guys, this is, these, these are our husbands back there. These are our people. These are what's wrong with you people. We need to go back and, and help them. And nobody said anything. And the guy who was instructing the boat basically threatened her to, to shut her mouth. And I think that's a really good example of how groupthink works. If you're saying something that goes against the crowd, you're the enemy. And I think that that's a really dangerous position to be in, um, whether it's in religion, whether it's in uh, a relationship, politics, whatever the case may be, groupthink is real. And it can be a very persuasive tool when you're trying to get people to agree with your ideologies, whether they're right or wrong. You can't go against the watchtower. You should not speak against the watchtower. To disagree with the watchtower or with anything that's being said or done in your congregation, which they call them congregations, by the way, not churches, then you are in a position of groupthink. You should not be different than all the other witnesses. Your beliefs should agree with all the other witnesses. So moving on, the last two that are bullet pointed here, the need for obedience and dependency. You are obedient to the organization and you are dependent on them. And then there's also a rigid set of rules that you have to follow and regulations as well. 
So these kinds of things compiled can all account for how they can control the behavior of the witness. All right, the next thing is repetitive behavior. <laughs> the key to mind control is repetition. I want you to think of a hamster on a hamster wheel. That's a Jehovah's Witness. They are constantly working. Their routine and their schedule is very rigid. They don't have time to think. They don't have time to research. They're just doing what they're told. They're trying to be devout witnesses. They are doing what they think is right. Guys really love them because they are stressed. And this is just purely my opinion, purely my opinion, but I find a very strong correlation with fibromyalgia and Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I, I, maybe it's like a stress disease. I don't know, but I don't understand why so many of them have fibromyalgia. But then you look at their schedule and, and think about it. They're, they're doing jobs. They have children. They have families. They have other responsibilities outside of just their religion, but the religion dominates their life. They are at the Kingdom Hall. They are going door to door. They are doing their watchtower studies. I would arguably say that a devout Jehovah's Witness wouldn't have one day go by where they weren't doing something for Jehovah's Kingdom. And because to the, in the mind of the Jehovah's Witness, if you're not doing something for Jehovah's organization, if you're not doing something for the kingdom, then you might die at Armageddon. You may not be doing enough to survive Armageddon. Um, which is part of their eschatology. And again, we will get into that, but that's a fear that motivates them. So I'm going to read some Watchtower quotes that are very pertinent to this topic. Okay, here's the first one. False religious propaganda <laughs> from any source should be avoided like poison. Really, since our Lord has used the faithful and discreet slave, which is the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, the, the, the men who run the organization, to convey to us sayings of everlasting life, why should we ever want to look anywhere else? Next, we must also be on guard against extended association with worldly people. Perhaps it's a neighbor, a school friend, a workmate, or a business associate. We may reason he respects the witnesses, he leads a clean life, and we do talk about the truth occasionally, Yet the experience of others proves that in time we may even find ourselves preferring such worldly company to that of a spiritual brother or sister. What are some of the dangers of such a friendship? Now, these are older quotes, but these are quotes that stay true. These are beliefs and ideologies that are undergirded in, in Jehovah's Witness culture. So, because you're, if you're not a Jehovah's Witness, now think about it for a second. If you're a Jehovah's Witness and your religion is telling you that everybody on the outside of the organization is evil and worldly, you're going to want to associate with other Jehovah's Witnesses. When in reality, if you were to actually go associate with other people, you might get a hint that maybe the organization's wrong. Think about Rapunzel, remember? <laughs> That's kind of what I'm getting at right here. They want them to avoid the world to stay clenched in, into the organization. And these are just a few quotes. You can find, you can go online to their own website and, and look up their publications and find that this stuff is still true today. And it's, it's very easy to find. All right, moving on to the I in the BITE model, which stands for information control. I personally find a lot of interest in this particular uh, part of mind control because I, I just think it's shocking. It, it's, it's weirdly fascinating to research these things and find out how it works. Um, but especially in the witness organization, it's shocking how they control the information that they get. So I kind of want you guys to think about the book that I mentioned in the beginning, George Orwell, 1984, but kind of think about in the book or you know, just in life in general, how there's authoritarian type control over the information that's critical of the group that you're discussing. The information that you're receiving must paint the organization in a good light to escape censorship. So typically an organization has a hidden agenda if it's censoring the information that it's giving its members. And we see this in many aspects of life, 
but especially in the Watchtower. They make threats to the followers that reading critical material against their religious institution will get them disfellowshipped or it will hand them over to Satan. Like you use these fear and guilt tactics to keep them from reading this material that's critical of the religion. It also has a hidden agenda. If the member of the organization is unable to access material that is critical of that organization. So Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, by the way, are not allowed to look at what they call apostate material. Apostates are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-members of the religion that have left. And the organization paints them like they are filthy and dirty and satanic. You do not want to talk to an apostate. They're evil. And they will take you away from Jehovah's organization. Mormons have the same thing except it's called anti-Mormon literature, stuff that's against their church. There are a lot of parallels between Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses that are unavoidable on many of these aspects that we're talking about. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, the only information you are allowed to look at is what's approved by the Watchtower. So the magazines, the publications they make, the website. If you go anywhere else, it's not only looked down upon, but you are a weak Jehovah's Witness. This is bad. That is wrong. What's right is, ooh, look at, we've already done the work for you. Here, read this. And it's censored, okay? So the Watchtower organization, whatever information they give them is tailored and censored to fit their theological agenda. So research into publications that are not approved by the governing body, the faithful and discreet slave, is strongly discouraged. Anything written by ex-members, apostates, is forbidden. Think about this logic for a second. I want everybody to kind of think about why they would strictly prohibit something like this. And some of you already know why they would do this, but if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're told not to look at apostate material, you're told not to look at it because if you do, then you will know the truth about your religion and organization and you will leave it. Now, the governing body, to an extent, knows that. And that's why they demonize it so much. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned the movie The Village. You do not leave the village. You do not go into the forest. You will die if you go into the forest. And it's all just a big illusion. It's a, it's a fear tactic. And then you go into the forest and you find out the truth, <laughs> that it's all a lie. So in this case, if I'm going to use a metaphor, the apostate literature is the forest. The Jehovah's Witnesses in the village and their little la-la land, their own little reality here. And some of them want to venture out and find out the truth, but they're afraid. They're deathly afraid. To go into the forest. So I hope that made sense. But the point is, is that you have to be really brave as a Jehovah's Witness to look at the literature of ex-members because I believe that the governing body knows that the apostates can out them. They know that the apostates can give contrary information to what the watchtower is teaching. So usually what happens, especially in this information age, which is ironic because it's hard to control information if it's everywhere, which is why a lot of witnesses can easily do this kind of research. But let's say that you're a Jehovah's Witness, you come to my door, I invite you in and we start talking. And let's just say after a few months, or you're having general doubts, you start thinking something's not right, I need to do more research. So you do, you start doing research and the snowball effect starts and you start reading apostate material and then you start agreeing with it. And then oh, I'm an apostate. <laughs> what do you do? You understand why they didn't want you reading apostate material because you would know the truth. And then you go try to warn others and you're looked at like how the watchtower wants you to be looked at. They want you to be looked at like you are filthy, that you left Jehovah's organization. How dare you leave the truth? 
you are satanic now, you are evil, you're, you're trying to get me out of the truth, out of the one true religion, be gone, be away from me. And it's really difficult to reach them in that way. So just kind of putting a view for those that may not understand on why the Watchtower does this and what that means to a Jehovah's Witness and why they have to control the information that is given to the witness because they trust the information given to them. So in their use of deception, they're deliberately holding back information. They can outright lie and they distort the information to make it more acceptable to their members. And as I talked about before, the access to the information outside of the organization is discouraged or minimized. And this includes things like in everyday life, watching TV, magazines, books, things like that. All right, so the next thing that they do is compartmentalization of information. So what I mean by this is that it's like outsider information versus insider information. And even some businesses can do this, but if, if you're somebody who is kind of like one of the many people employed by a company, you're not going to necessarily know the ins and outs of how the company functions. So the more important doctrines, the inside core information is always up here at the top and all the little people just do what they're told. The information that is made up at the top and the information given from the top is not easily accessible. You can't just go talk to a governing body member, so to speak, and because they're kind of untouchable. And then beyond that, because they are the leadership, they decide what you need to know. And they kind of keep away from the other information that would seem critical of their leadership. Another aspect of information control and arguably behavior control is that the members spy and snitch on each other. Again, this does remind me of like an Orwellian type belief system where you better be following the rules and you're going to be a good comrade if you tell on the people that aren't. In fact, you might be rewarded for it. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're having doubts, you should not tell your best friend because they're loyal to Jehovah and his organization. They'll snitch on you to the elders. You can be ostracized very quickly. So if you're having doubts, you basically keep it to yourself out of fear. And I'm sure a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses feel that way. They, they do have doubts, but because they're fear oriented, they do not say it out loud. That's just one example of many. You could be snitched on for a lot of things. Another aspect of information control is the generated propaganda that the organization makes for its members. If anybody is somewhat familiar with a lot of Jehovah's Witness beliefs, the images on their magazines and their books is very strong images. And, and I'll show you an example of this later on, but there's a lot of fear propaganda and it's, it's supposed to invoke changes in their behavior so that they stay obedient to the organization. We talked about how they can misquote from sources and I will give you an example of that here in a few minutes. But the next thing I want to talk about is something that is called confession. With a Jehovah's Witness, one way that they kind of help modify and control your behavior is when you do something wrong, if you sin, you confess your sin to the elders, you come clean. You feel very strongly about this as a Jehovah's Witness. So for an example, I actually had a friend that was in one of these situations. I've had many ex-Jehovah's Witnesses tell me they're terrible experiences with this, but one in particular, she had committed a sin that was bad enough that she felt like it needed to be confessed to the elders. This is different than going to say like an accountability partner, somebody that would keep you accountable for the things that you're doing. Maybe that's bad, you know, and you pray together and you work with it and through it together. This is different. We'll get into how the witness organization works, but they have something they call a judicial committee, which might be something that would be appropriate if you came and confessed a terrible sin and they would need to have a committee get together and decide if you needed to be disfellowshipped or not. Um, but in this case, she's going to the elders to confess what she had done. They're all men, mind you. 
And they're asking her very personal questions about what she had done. And it's very inappropriate. So a lot of times whenever you're before, if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're before these elders, especially if you're a woman, you're telling them these things. And it's difficult. But because there's such a strong emphasis on confession, you tell them everything. You come as clean as you can. Why? Because they need to keep track of you as a witness so it could possibly be used against you later on. Sounds a lot like Scientology and what they do with their methods. Part of the reason why this is emphasized is because if a member is reported to have done a wrongdoing and rather than confess that, they're far more likely to be considered unrepentant and then disfellowship for it. So you better come clean right away. I'm going to read some quotes directly from the Watchtower that will solidify this point. Again, there's a lot, but this just solidifies it more. So if doubts, complaints, or apostasy threaten to contaminate you spiritually, cut them away quickly. Get help from the congregation elders. It is certainly not easy to confess to others deeds that one feels ashamed of and to seek forgiveness. It takes inner strength. If he does not do this within a reasonable period of time, concern from the cleanliness of the congregation should move you to report the matter to the elders. Now, I want to make a comment on this real quick. I was actually given an example of this by a Jehovah's Witness, a very devout, lifelong Jehovah's Witness, of how they feel like they need to keep out bad association and keep cleanliness within the congregation because they, they want to associate with, with good people, with good Jehovah's Witnesses. And the way she put it was that if, if you have a glass of water and then you have an, a dropper filled with ink and you take a drop of that ink and you put it in the water, then the whole water is now contaminated with the ink. And that's how they think of that. If there's one weak Jehovah's Witness or if there's anybody in there that could contaminate the rest of them, they don't want to associate with them because they're the ink, they're the water, they're the pure ones. And that if they associate with other people, then they're going to be contaminated. <laughs> That's how they think of that. Think about this for a second. If you're a Jehovah's Witness and you have depression, you're having doubts, whatever it is, you're the ink. And that's just within the congregation. If you're somebody that puts on a facade of joy or that you're, you're a good Jehovah's Witness, then you're going to be looked at as the water. So it's, it's very black and white in that sense. And I believe personally, this is my opinion, but I think that's why a lot of them do put on a fake facade. A lot of them are not happy, but you have to act happy. You have to because you're told that Jehovah's people are the happiest people on earth. And if you're not one of the happiest people on earth, then maybe you're weak in, in mind. Maybe you're not as spiritual as the rest. And so even though majority might feel that way, you'll never know because you don't want to be ostracized. You don't want to be put off. You don't want to be the ink. Okay, so moving on, I have a lot to say about information control, but I am going to quote more quotes from the Watchtower about researching, about studying, because it's, it's downplayed. You don't want to do a lot of heavy research. It's looked down upon because the research has already been done for you. Um, this is a quote from the Watchtower. It says, we may think of study as hard work, as involving heavy research. But in Jehovah's organization, it is not necessary to spend a lot of time and energy in research, for there are brothers in the organization who are assigned to do that very thing to help you who do not have so much time for this. These preparing the good materials in the Watchtower and other publications of the society. Take this suggestion. Often the very best and most beneficial studying you do is that done when you read a new Watchtower or Awake or a new book with the joy of getting the new truths and a fresh view. Now there's, there's a lot more on this, but basically the Watchtower is very open very open. It's very easy to look at their own words on their website, in their publications about how research 
is, is downplayed. I mean, they'll say yes. And a Jehovah's witness will say this, that yes, we research, we do this stuff, but it's only research done in watchtower approved material. You are not allowed to do free independent research. You're allowed to do studying that's given to you only by and approved by the watchtower organization, which is not a real study at all. If you can't look at opposing beliefs, if you're not allowed to do that, there's something wrong with your beliefs then. All right, so to further uh, show this point, I'm gonna read another quote from the Watchtower. Under the guidance of his Holy Spirit and on the basis of his word of truth, Jehovah provides what is needed so that all of God's people may be fitly united in the same mind and in the same line of thought and remain stabilized in the faith. The faithful and discreet slave, which is the governing body, the leaders of the Jehovah's Witness religion, does not endorse any literature, meetings, or websites that are not produced or organized under its oversight. For those who wish to do extra Bible study and research, we recommend that they explore insight on the scriptures, which is a Jehovah's Witness made book. It's made by the Jehovah's Witness religion. And again, as we have gone over, that's the only approved information that you're allowed to research and look into if you're a Jehovah's Witness. A few years ago, I did go to their district convention, and this point is emphasized regularly. You do not go to other websites, read books, or anything that is critical of the organization. You don't do it. I remember the... Jehovah's Witness, the man who gave the talk was very firm. He was very direct. Don't do it. He reminded me of like a really strict authoritarian type uh, parent where it's just, you don't question this. This is something you must do. All right. Now I'm going to give you a real life example of what they do all the time. And I'm going to show you how they do this by showing you some examples of how information control works in the Watchtower. Uh, now this example I'm gonna give is actually from their own reasoning from the scriptures book. It's my dog, he wants attention. Not right now, Max, I'm busy. Anyway, if, if you're not familiar with this, every Jehovah's Witness that I know of carries this around. And what it reminds me of is kind of like when I worked in a call center and what you have is kind of like a little script when somebody calls in, you have the same response, the same answer to the question that they're calling in with. That, that's kind of what this is. So if you ask a question about, I don't know, the Bible or Armageddon or miracles or whatever, this is in alphabetical order how you respond to them. This is one reason why Jehovah's Witnesses will have almost the same exact answer to any question that's asked pretty much universally. It's really rare in my op opinion and experience that you'll find a Jehovah's Witness that disagrees with one another because they're taught the same thing in the organization as a whole. Congregations are different from one another and they do function differently, um, but the beliefs and the doctrines are standard and static. So if you're asking, in this case, we're going to talk about their belief on the cross. So this is basically their script to you whenever you ask a question. A lot of them have this memorized, believe it or not. This is actually really hard to get a hold of because this isn't typically something that they, they don't give this to you. They, they will not, this is not a standard publication that they give out to the public. But what I'm going to talk about and what I'm going to use is from this, this little booklet that they use. And it's under the questions people would ask about the cross. Now, for those of you that don't know, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus died on a cross. Uh, we will get into more of this later. I know I keep saying this, but I have to be organized with how I, I go about this, this whole series. But uh, they believe that Jesus died on a stake. And they, they look at the cross like it's repulsive and pagan. Because that's a unique doctrine to the Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of people ask about that. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you have somebody asking about the cross, well, just go to the C in your reason, reasoning from the scriptures, little booklet, and give the answer for what it says, like a script. All right, so I'm just going to read this and then we'll go on from there. This is on page 89 underneath the explanation for a cross. And it says, 
the Imperial Bible Dictionary, which is where they're quoting from, okay? So they're using the Imperial Bible Dictionary to make their point, acknowledges this saying, the Greek word for cross, staros, properly signified a stake, an upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used in impaling, fencing in, a piece of ground, dot, dot, dot. This is important, remember that little dot. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appears to have been originally an upright pole. Now that is where they are getting this information from. So according to this, according to the Watchtower publication, they're trying to use the Imperial Bible Dictionary to back up their belief that Jesus died, not on a cross, but on a stake. And the way that they're showing that the rest of Christianity is wrong is by showing this historical quote from the Imperial Bible Dictionary, which appears to say that it was a stake that Jesus died on. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to go look at the Imperial Bible Dictionary. What's highlighted in yellow is what they used in the reasoning book. What's in purple is what they left out. So let's read it. So remember the dot, dot, dot. Let's read this again with the rest of the quote put in. All right, it says the Greek word rendered cross, saros, properly signified a stake, an upright pole or a piece of paling on which anything might be hung, or which might be used in impaling a piece of ground. Remember, this is where they stopped the quote, but let's read it in its context. It says, but a modification was introduced as the dominion and usages of Rome extended themselves through Greek-speaking countries. So what modification was this? Let's keep reading. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appears to have been originally an upright pole, comma, they didn't finish the quote. And this always remained the more prominent part. But from the time that it began to be used as an instrument of punishment, a transverse piece of wood was commonly added, not however always even then. And then if you read here on the bottom, it's saying that crucifixion was very common. If they had used the quotation in context, they, they never would have been able to use that. So they pick and choose bits and pieces of what looks like a scholarly source to make it look to the witness like this is legitimate. Do you see how they did that? And they do this all the time. This is why they're not allowed to look at other information. Yes, they use the Imperial Bible Dictionary, but is that approved by the Watchtower? No, the Watchtower approved publication, Reasoning from the Scriptures, is going to use that in an appropriate way. You're the Jehovah's Witness. We're the governing body. You take the information we give you and don't ask questions. So because they trust the governing body and they trust this because it's from the governing body, they have no need to go look in the Imperial Bible Dictionary to see if that was actually true. It's not, but they're taking it like it is. So when you have people that go and they look at this and say you were to actually try to tell them this, they wouldn't trust you because you're worldly. You're, you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're not spirit you're not part of the spirit directed organization why would i listen to you this came directly from the governing body that's who i trust so this would never be acceptable the full quotation would never be acceptable in a jehovah's witness publication they have to edit it to make it fit their theology to make it look like what they believe is legitimate again this is only one example of uh oh, thousands and i'll show you another one right now so this next one I actually found on my own a long time ago. You can find this. If you get Watchtower magazines, you can actually go online as well because they have their uh, jw.org website. And you can look at their Watchtower and Awake magazines. You can also get them directly from the witnesses. And you can do this yourself. You can actually look at their, this one's an older one. This is a Watchtower magazine. This one's an Awake magazine. You can go through these and purposely look for quotations from scholars, 
or from any resource really, and look at the original source and see if it matches up. A lot of times it doesn't. Now in this particular Watchtower magazine, it was from the May 1st, 2012 Watchtower. This is just one example. I like giving this example because it's my favorite. They quoted a very prominent, well-known Trinitarian scholar, some of you might know who he is, Ben Witherington III. And I thought, why are they quoting him? So let me read it to you and let me show you how this works. All right, now just to remind you, this is the uh, Watchtower, May 1st, 2012. This is under the section, why were some Jews stumbled by the manner of Jesus's death? I'm reading the highlighted part. It says, regarding Jesus's manner of death, and the culture of those living in the Middle East in the first century, Bible commentator Bill Witherington III says that it was the most shameful way to die in that world. It was not seen as a noble martyrdom of any sort. Witherington further states, people in that world believe that the manner of your death most revealed your character. Okay, now at first glance, people are like, okay, well, what's the problem? The problem is this. Let, look at this again. I, I want to make sure that people understand how this is done and how subtle it is. Okay, remember, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe Jesus died on a cross. He died on a stake. So they're going to give information to back up the fact that they believe that Jesus died on a stake. All right, so this is implied to the witness regarding Jesus's manner of death. Okay, his manner of death to a Jehovah's Witness is that he died on a stake. All right. Now to back up Jesus dying on a stake to support that, they're going to quote Ben Witherington. Commentator Ben Witherington III says that it, it dying on a stake was the most shameful way to die in that world. Now here's the thing. If you would go read the actual article that they're quoting from, that's not what it says. In its full context, it says this, the real sticking point for Jesus's followers is that the culture of the Middle East at that time, and still today, was an honor and shame culture. And crucifixion was the most shameful way to die in that world. It was not seen as a noble martyrdom of any sort. Do you guys see how they purposely left out the word crucifixion and quoted only part of what Witherington was saying. This is manipulation of information. They're taking it and making it seem like a scholar, like Ben Witherington, who's a Trinitarian, he's a Christian, is saying that Jesus died on a stake. They're implying that. Now, nobody would really catch that unless you actually went and saw these inconsistencies. Ben Witherington is saying crucifixion was the most shameful way to die. But they're taking his quote, kind of cutting it out, taping it back up, and making it look like dying on a stake was the most shameful way to die. Do you, do you see how this works? You guys understand? They do this all the time. This is all over their publications. I can look in pretty much anything they make, and I will find stuff like this over and over again. Again, this is why they do not want them looking at other things. They can control their information and therefore you control what they believe. Also, by the way, I don't know if, again, a lot of people watching know a lot about Jehovah's Witnesses beliefs. We will again get into this later. Oh, I sound like a broken record. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is not God. They think that the Trinity is a pagan, evil belief. So for them to quote somebody that is a Trinitarian and believes, you know, that Jesus died on a cross uh, is very telling that they will basically take from any source to make it appear as if their beliefs are valid. And this is from the governing body. Okay. They're the ones who make the decision. So I'm just pointing that out because the reason why Ben Witherington being a Trinitarian is important is because they have such strong beliefs against 
Trinitarianism. All right, a few more things on information control, then we'll move on to thought control, but this is important to mention. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the organization discourages higher education. Now, this kind of couples together with freedom of information in a way, because you want to be able to have freedom to research anything. So for a Jehovah's Witness, if you are researching the Jehovah's Witnesses, you're basically studying Watchtower material, especially if you've grown up in the religion. So you, you, you can't just freely go research your religion or anything that's not approved by God's channel of communication, the governing body, the Watchtower organization, the truth. So when they discourage looking at any other inf information that is approved by them, they also are very vocal about discouraging. This is, it's an important, uh, very intentional word I'm using, discouraging uh, higher education, which means a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses don't go to college. They don't pursue a higher education. Some do, but that is rare. Uh, I, I would say that a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses would say that it's a personal decision, which I guess it is, I suppose it is. Um, and that is true to an extent, but the governing body is very open about not pursuing a higher education. There's a few reasons for this. One, why would you pursue a higher education when Armageddon is right around the corner? Why would you waste your time getting educated in worldly things when you could be preaching the kingdom message. That's what you need to be spending your time on doing. So there's that. The other reason why I see that they discourage higher education is that it, and especially in the West, it promotes critical thinking. All right. So uh, in different cultures, it's, it's different in different cultures, but here in the West, we're very big about critical thinking. We want to know all the facts. We want to research. We, we can ask questions of our superiors, of our pastors, of our authority figures in the quest of just gathering information. That's done because we're thinking, all right? Now to the Jehovah's Witness, the thinking is already basically done for them. <laughs> so they don't have a need or desire to think critically about what they believe because then that would cause them to question God's channel of communication. So I've also noticed a correlation between Jehovah's Witnesses who go to college, who, who do get higher education and ones that don't. In my personal endeavors in ministry and talking to them is I, I, they do think critically. They're actually very easy to talk to compared to other Jehovah's Witnesses. I think, in my opinion, that if you find a Jehovah's Witness who is going to college and they are pursuing a higher education, you got yourself a thinker. You got somebody who would be a potential good person to talk to, and maybe uh, they will listen to you and might actually research the organization and come to Christ. Now to show this and to just give a quote, and again, this is something that they're, they're pretty vocal about, the governing body and Jehovah's Witnesses in general, but here's a quote from them, from the 2008 Watchtower. It says, what though of higher education received in a college or university? This is widely viewed as vital to success, yet many who pursue such education end up with their minds filled with harmful propaganda. That's ironic, don't you think? Such education wastes valuable, youthful years that could best be used in Jehovah's service. Perhaps it is not surprising that in lands where many have received such an education, belief in God is at an all-time low, which is not really true. I'm not sure where they're getting that statistic from. Rather than looking to the advanced educational systems of this world for security, a Christian trusts in Jehovah, which again, translated means you trust in the organization, you trust in Jehovah's organization. Okay, so moving on to thought control. You might be thinking, okay, how do you control somebody's thoughts? But I'm sure by now you can kind of understand how uh, in controlling somebody's environment and through fear and manipulation, how something like this could happen. But a thought control relates to basically forcing a belief that the group alone teaches the truth. The, the doctrines of the leaders cannot be questioned and alternative viewpoints are forbidden. 
So to go over a few examples of what I mean by this, and again, this is all in uh, Stephen Hassan's book, jwfacts.com is, is a great resource on this, but basically you have a need to internalize the group's doctrine as the truth. So everything else is false. It's very black and white, which is a mind control technique. It's us versus them. There is no gray area. If you're not with us, you're against us and you are the enemy. If you think differently, or if you are against what's going on here in this organization, then you're the enemy. And there's also this use of what's called loaded language. Um, it's kind of like having their own language within the organization. Throughout this video, I've been trying to be really careful with the words that I'm using because some people may not understand that uh, when a Jehovah's Witness uses a word, it means something different to them than it does to us. So like a word for them would be worldly. All right, worldly to us would be something very different to a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, the new system, paradise earth, the faithful and discreet slave, the slave, the truth. Uh, they, they have all these different words that have different meanings to them. Uh, to us, it's grace. Um, to them, it's undeserved kindness. And they, to us, it's faith. To them, it's exercising faith. And we'll go over a little bit more of that as, as we move on. But there's something with loaded language called thought stopping cliches. Now, some of you might know what that means, but it can be something that's said to the witness that immediately can shut down their train of thought because of the disdain they have for what you just said. So I'll get a little bit more into loaded language and how that all works. But first I want to go back to the black and white thinking, the us versus them. Again, to, to drive this point home, it, they believe that if you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you basically don't worship God. You worship a false God. So to them, somebody like me, I'm basically worshiping Satan because I say I'm a Christian. I'm a born again Christian. Um, and I'm a Trinitarian and I'm not part of Jehovah's organization to them. That's me against the organization. I am not, I am part of Satan's system in their eyes. Now to give examples of this, uh, from the actual watchtower, here are some more quotes. If we stop actively supporting Jehovah's work, then we start following Satan. There is no middle ground. Either you are serving Jehovah God or Satan, the devil. Regardless of your answer, if you follow the unrighteous ways of the world, you cannot be serving the true God, Jehovah. The next quote, are you so different from the majority of mankind that you can say that they are serving the devil, but that you are serving the true God? There is a people who are that different. And everyone knows they are different and no part of the world. They are the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses pride themselves on being unified. They, uh, they always say that they are different and unified and different from any other religion in Christian, Christendom. They call it Christendom, uh, which is true. I actually commend them for that. I think that the, the Jehovah's Witnesses do a very good job of staying unified. However, in the quest to stay unified, they distinguish disagreement. If you disagree with them, you're looked at as the enemy. So it's like, yay, we're being unified and nobody else is as unified as us Jehovah's Witnesses. Yay, we must be the true religion. But they don't realize that they're forced to stay unified. <laughs> it's forced upon them because if they disagree, then they're part of Satan's system. Now, I also want to touch on uh, something they call discouragement of discussion since we're on this topic. There's a lot to say about this, but one thing I want to point out is that with the Watchtower, with people who are familiar with the Watchtower, with any of their publications, they will say that they follow the Bible, that everything that they believe is from the Bible. And what that's that's half true because what it is and I only say this it's the Bible plus so if you have the Bible you cannot according to the governing body and the organization you cannot understand the Bible without the organization you have to have the organization interpret the Bible for you now tell me tell me that they don't just have all the control over what the Bible means then so what they'll say and what they'll do is they'll have a something that they'll say, some sort of doctrinal statement about 
how Jesus isn't God or blood transfusions are not godly or whatever the case may be, what they'll do is they'll say their doctrine that's unique to the watchtower and then boom, just plug in a verse, like a, a, a reference to a verse. And the witness just automatically thinks, oh, well, there's my biblical proof for what they're saying. And a witness will say, some of them will say, yes, I go back and I read it and it makes perfect sense. But when you have those goggles on, it's really hard because you're not supposed to question your resource that you even got it from. You're basically taught how to interpret that scripture. You're not taught what the scripture says. You're taught how to interpret it through the eyes of the watchtower. So eisegesis, exegesis, that's basically what they're doing. It's eisegesis. It's, it's, it's bad subjective viewing of the scriptures. They're controlling what the scriptures actually say, discouraging free independent reading of the Bible because that's bad. It needs to be interpreted through the watchtower. Now, another example of this, that I kind of want to demonstrate is how the Jehovah's Witnesses see the material given to them from the Watchtower compared to the actual Bible. And this is my own personal experience. This is my own personal interpretation of this, but it's also very obvious as well. It, it, you can see this if you used to be a Jehovah's Witness or if you're studying with them or have done a lot of research. But when I was with my Jehovah's Witnesses a long time ago, we would do our weekly Bible studies. <laughs> it's really a Watchtower publication alongside the Bible. And one thing I noticed is that whenever we were doing our, our Bible studies, they go kind of like by an order of certain things that you're supposed to go over. And I noticed her little booklet that she was using, which was this one at the time. It was, um, what does the Bible really teach? They have updated it since then, but this is what they go over. This is what they'll give you. They would give you back then and anyway, at the door that would give you the information on Jehovah's Witness theology. Now her Bible teach book, which is what they call it. They call it the Bible teach book. At least back then they did was tattered and worn. And I mean, you could see the, the, the edges of the publication was just, it was coming off and her Bible was crisp and clean. And I thought that was a very telling nonverbal statement of how Jehovah's Witnesses view their publications. Their Bible is an aid, but they can't understand it without the watchtower. So just kind of driving that point home that, that the view of the Bible compared to the publications, they'll say that they read the Bible and they will say that everything that they believe is in the Bible, but it's only in the Bible because it has been interpreted into the Bible by them. And they arguably would know more about their own doctrine than they would about the Bible. So that's all relevant because you can't discuss the Bible, all right? You know how like you can just get together and do an independent Bible study with just the Bible? Jehovah's Witnesses can't do that. A Bible study to them is always accompanied with Watchtower material because they can't understand the Bible on their own. Now, I'm going to read a quote from a man named Ray Franz. Ray Franz, by the way, this is really important to know. He wrote this book, Crisis of Conscience. He wrote another book called In Search of Christian Freedom as well. I haven't read that one, but I do own this one. And now Ray Franz is a very pivotal figure in the Jehovah's Witness history he was on the governing body and left the governing body. And he wrote a book about why. <laughs> uh, he wrote two books about why. And he was actually very respectful and I would say kind in how he basically outed them. And it's a very interesting book. I think it's out of print, unfortunately. So it's actually hard to get a hold of. But if you really want to understand the core doctrines and the core problems with what goes on in the Watchtower. This is a good book to get, but I'm going to read a quote from him that kind of segues into how they discourage free discussion. It's a, and again, this is quoted in Search of Christian Freedom. To this day, in all countries, any persons among Jehovah's Witnesses who find they cannot conscientiously support fully 
the organization's teachings or practices live in a climate of fear, feeling they must constantly be on guard as to what they say, what they do, what they read, with whom they associate, from whom they receive letters, not feeling any sense of freedom, even when among personal friends or close relatives, if these are also witnesses. As stated in my personal experience, I have had people phone who were afraid to give their name or who felt it necessary to use a fictitious name, some who even felt it necessary to take out a special post office to be able to correspond without danger of their correspondence with me or other former witnesses being discovered. They face a form of hostage situation produced by the organization's authority. The only way to avoid this is to meet the terms the organization lays down. So that is a very telling quote from somebody who has been on the inside. You don't want people to know that you're having doubts. You can't just discuss things openly. If I'm having doubts or having some sort of spiritual struggle or whatever, I can pretty much openly discuss those things, at least I would hope so, <laughs> within uh, my community of Christian friends. Now, some people do discourage that, and that doesn't, that's not just true for the Jehovah's Witnesses, unfortunately, but in this case, it's a paramount discouragement. I don't know how many people have been to a kingdom hall, but what they do is they'll have their, their watchtower study. They'll have the one that they give you, by the way, is different than the one that they receive as witnesses. There's a study edition. And in the study edition, they get it every week and uh, they, they do their homework. It's like homework for life is what they're doing. They'll have the Watchtower study edition and they'll, they'll study it the week before. And when they go to the Kingdom Hall on Sunday, they are expected to know what's in their, their study edition, what's in their Watchtower magazine and they have a question answer session. Now you would think that this would be like a free conversation, but it's not. It's another way of indoctrination as the way I see it, because you're reading what's in the study edition, and then they have questions on the bottom that are directly found right back up in the paragraph or what you just read. There is no encouragement of giving a answer that's from your mind, a thought-provoking response. You are expected to respond how your study tells you to respond. If you don't, then you're basically not going to be called on as much, or you could be publicly reproved in front of the congregation. You do, and you answer and do as the study tells you to do. So there is no free discussion of that. There is no hey, sister so-and-so, do you want to come over to my house and we we'll go over even the latest watchtower and do your own independent personal study um, together with somebody else? That's discouraged. And I bet you can tell and know why is because if you were to do something like that, that promotes free independent thinking, which is discouraged by the watchtower. Now, I will say, and I mentioned this before, that not every congregation is as strict as another but for the most part, the general understanding of all Jehovah's Witnesses is you don't question the Watchtower on any level. You might be thinking, do they really discourage independent thinking? I applaud your critical thinking and asking that question. But yes, they do. This is easily researchable. You can go to their website. You can look at their publications. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that I've met with are actually very open about this. It's almost like they're proud of it. No, we don't independently think. That's demonic. That's not, that's worldly. We have the truth. So here are some quotes just to kind of drive this point home. I love quotes. I think quotes are very, very telling because you're looking directly at the religion and just reading it for what they have to say. Okay, the first one is from Watchtower uh, 1983. Avoid questioning the counsel that is provided by God's visible organization. Some who point out that the organization has had to make some adjustments before, and so they argue, this shows that we have to make up our own mind on what to believe. This is independent thinking. Why is it so dangerous? The next one's from Watchtower 2001. First, since oneness is to be observed, and they mean oneness as far as unity, 
a mature Christian must be in unity and full harmony with fellow believers as far as faith and knowledge are concerned. He does not advocate or insist on personal opinions or harbor private ideas when it comes to Bible understanding. The next one is uh, beware of those who try to put forward their own contrary opinions. That's Watchtower 1986. And there's more just to drive the point home, to make the point. From time to time, there have arisen from among the ranks of Jehovah's people, those who, like the original Satan, have adopted an independent fault-finding attitude. They say that it is sufficient to read the Bible exclusively, either alone or in small groups at home. But strangely, through such Bible reading, they have reverted right back to the apostate doctrines that commentaries by Christendom's clergy, clergy were teaching which means they basically became Trinitarians and born-again Christians. <laughs> That's what independent Bible reading does. It gets you back to the actual doctrines of the Bible. Mm, no wonder they want to keep that away from it. Anyway, more on that later. Two more quotes. To turn away from Jehovah and his organization, to spurn the direction of the faithful and discreet slave, and to rely simply on personal Bible reading and interpretation is to become like a solitary tree in a parched land. That's Watchtower 1985. All right, last one is avoid independent thinking. How is such independent thinking manifested? A common way is by questioning the counsel that is provided by God's visible organization. That's Watchtower 1983. Now, if that's not the clearest example of what I'm trying to say, I don't know what is. They are very open and honest about not questioning and not thinking for yourself. So forbidding questioning and discouraging research is a very powerful mind control tool. So I'm going to move on and talk a little bit more about loaded language before we talk about emotional control, because this is important if you want to learn how you sound to a Jehovah's Witness when you say certain things. Now, there's a very specific example I'm going to use to make this point, but um, a while ago, I had a really bad experience with a red chili burrito. <laughs> I live in New Mexico. We love red and green chili out here. It's part of the culture. But this particular experience um, was very unpleasant. After this experience, I no longer looked at red chili the same way. I looked at it and I got sick. I'm, I'm sure you guys can actually really relate to this. Have you ever had a, a bad experience with a food or drink or anything like that, where even if you see it again or smell it, or it's just in your presence, you're just ugh, like, it makes you kind of sick. It brings back all those memories, those horrible memories of, you know, what it did to you. And so you have a repulsion for it. All right. So in my case, every time that I uh, had any sort of inkling of red chili being in my food, it made me almost physically ill. I couldn't take it. So for many years, I could not eat red chili. Thankfully, for the most part, I am, you know, past that aversion, but it's a very, very strong repulsion you have because of that experience you had. Now, I use that example because this is what happens in a sense, in an emotional sense, when we say certain things to the Jehovah's Witness. So what I mean by that is that it's a really common form of thought control um, that high control groups have to have loaded language. And what that is, is that it's terms that are unique to that organization in meaning and in use. And we talked a little bit about this before, that to a Jehovah's Witness, different words mean different things. They have their own language. And if you don't understand the meaning of that language, you might misuse it, or they might hear something different than what you're saying. The other part of it is what I call the red chili effect. So you have to understand how you sound to a Jehovah's Witness when you're saying certain things. So to them, when you say, I'm a born again Christian, to them, that's like a red chili effect. Ugh because they're taught to hate certain things that you believe in. When you talk about Jesus being God, it shuts down the point that you're trying to make and discredits you right away. Right when you start talking about the deity of Jesus or hell 
or the immortal soul or things that are, you know, typical Christian beliefs, they immediately red chili affect you because they're taught to hate the Trinity. They are taught to hate apostates or anything that talks against the religion. It shuts down everything mentally when they hear those things. So in this effect, in this way, language that we use can go against our purposes when speaking to a Jehovah's Witness. And I believe it's in the next ser- or in the next video I want to get into on how to witness to them. We'll talk more about this as well, about what not to say, what to say, things like that, that I personally find to be uh, effective and what's ineffective in my experience. All right, moving on to the E in the bite model, it's for emotional control. So emotional control includes the use of fear and guilt, and it places the blame upon the individuals in the organization. However, all of this also works with toxic relationships. Mind control tactics are actually used in toxic relationships as well. And I kind of use the relationship that Jehovah's Witnesses have with the watchtower as like a toxic relationship. They stay for the wrong reasons. I've had people ask, like, why do Jehovah's Witnesses stay in this religion if they have this experience? And the example that I give is, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, is that either you have been in a toxic relationship or know somebody who has been or is in a very unhealthy, toxic relationship. Why do they stay? Why did you stay? That dynamic, that unhealthy dynamic is why they stayed and why you stayed. It's a manipulation. It's a very unhealthy relationship. You stay out of fear. You stay out of guilt. And if you try to leave, how dare you? Who's going to love you now? I'm the truth. The organization has the truth. We have the truth. How dare you leave the truth? And they put the shame and fear and guilt on the witness trying to leave. They take no responsibility. I'm sure a lot of people can understand that example, unfortunately. Now, another direct example I'm gonna give that is actually uh, unique to the Jehovah's Witnesses is the year 1975. Uh, To most people that doesn't mean much, but to people that know a little bit about Jehovah's Witness background and doctrine, or if you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness that actually lived back then, you know exactly what I'm referring to. There was a huge, prophecy blunder on the part of the Watchtower in 1975. They basically predicted that Armageddon was going to come in 1975 and very, very strongly implied in their publications that that was exactly what was going to happen. And the witnesses had every reason to believe that Armageddon was going to come in 1975. The Watchtower told them to sell their homes. The Watchtower told them to stop having kids, get out of college, Armageddon's coming, what are you doing, what are you thinking, let's, you know, go out and do the theocratic work, and that's what they were highly, highly encouraged to do. Now, 1975 came and went with no Armageddon, and lots of witnesses were very disillusioned by this, and they're like, what gives? You guys said that Armageddon's coming, and it didn't come, And you know what the watchtower did? They blamed it on the witnesses. They said, this was your fault. You misunderstood us. We never said that. We never actually meant that. It's your fault that you thought that. So it's not our fault. That is manipulation. That's emotional manipulation. So instead of taking responsibility for it, they swept it under the rug and moved on. And a lot of witnesses, because they trusted that, they're under this mind control, went along with them. Thankfully, a lot of witnesses actually left after that. Steve Hassan in his book points out the excessive use of fear in emotional control. Fear. If you want people to believe what you're saying and go along with what you're saying and doing, get them very, very afraid. There's fear of independent thinking, fear of the outside world, fear of enemies, fear of losing one's salvation, fear of leaving the group or being shunned by people. Then there's fear of disapproval. The common theme is fear. Be afraid. Jehovah's Witnesses live in a constant 
mind frame of fear. That is their main motivator. And the watchtower knows it. He goes on to point out something called phobia indoctrination. And this is basically indoctrinating irrational fears about ever leaving the group or even questioning the leader's authority. So the person under mind control cannot possibly visualize an outcome that leaves them without the organization. So you cannot have happiness and completeness outside of this organization. Terrible consequences will take place if you leave. You'll be shunned. You might die at Armageddon, which is a huge fear for a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, some people liken them to like a doomsday cult because they do believe that Armageddon is going to come any day. Are they good enough to survive Armageddon? This is kind of their eschatology. Um, we'll break it down more in later videos, but they believe that Armageddon is going to come at the end of the world is going to come at any point, And they are afraid that they're going to die in Armageddon. They also believe that it's a possibility that they can become demon possessed. They are very afraid of Satan. They're very afraid of demons. Now for most Christians, we don't really have a fear so much of those kinds of things because we believe God's more powerful, not to a Jehovah's witness. A Jehovah's witness looks at Satan like he's very powerful and that he can pounce on them. So when you're talking to them and maybe you are getting their wheels turning, that's a, that's a very difficult thing for a Jehovah's Witness to accept and do because they have so much to overcome to entertain what you're saying. I actually have a story about this. I had a Jehovah's Witness friend who was kind of like how it was described in the Ray Franz uh, quote from above. She was kind of incognito, <laughs> undercover, questioning Jehovah's Witness. Nobody can know. And we were friends online and I was helping her. And she told me that she was having a lot of difficulty visiting websites that she knew. She knew the, the organization was wrong. She knew that God was not in control of this organization but the locks were still on. And when she tried to go to these websites like JW Facts or ForJehovah.org or all, all these other wonderful uh, websites and, and ministries out here that help Jehovah's Witnesses, she said that when she tried to go and, and read this stuff, she got physically ill. She got sick. It was really hard for her to overcome the, the control that they had over her mind in this, in this emotional realm. She felt like she was going to be demonized. She felt like Satan was going to take control of her. She felt like she was in a complete realm of fear. And that is hard to overcome. She was very, very brave. So kind of keep in mind as you're talking to them that the red chili effect can happen to even thinking Jehovah's Witnesses or witnesses that are trying to leave. Um, another phobia indoctrination is uh, the fear of being shunned, that you're going to be rejected by your friends and family to the extreme. They don't even look at you. You are basically dead to them. And to them, there's never a good enough reason to leave. There's never a legitimate reason to question the organization. From the group's perspective, from the organization's perspective, people who leave are weak, they're undisciplined, they're worldly, they're unspiritual, they're demonic, uh, they're brainwashed, they're seduced by money, sin, some other sensual experience that they want to have that the religion doesn't give them. They're just sinners. So there's no reason in their mind, why, we, why would you want to leave the truth? Another thing that this kind of reminds me of is Stockholm Syndrome. I know that a lot of people might know what that is, other people may not, but it's basically when uh, people that are in an abusive situation are bonded, basically, with their captors. So for Jehovah's Witnesses, they're, they're kept captive. And if you're a Christian, you understand really who they're being kept captive by. It's not just the watchtower. This is a spiritual cap captivity, all right? And in this sense, in a human sense, they have this really unhealthy adoration and love for the watchtower that keeps them captive. 
that it kind of reminds me of that is they love their abusers. So moving on, we talked about fear before and how that's a very strong tool that the watchtower uses to control its members. Fear is really what the Jehovah's Witness organization uses to control its members and keep them doing what they're required to do. So they'll emphasize like love and joy in the new system, Paradise Earth. Um, but the issue is that it's an equ equally as strong emphasis on fear of worldly people, of Armageddon, of disobeying the organization that's being placed on the witness. The Jehovah's Witness, for the most part, has a fear of Armageddon. Now they'll say they look forward to it because Armageddon means that, you know, Paradise Earth is going to be ushered in, yada, yada. But for the most part, I'm going to show you guys some images, propaganda images that are used in Jehovah's Witness publications to show what will happen at Armageddon. Now, now tell me, if you were a child seeing this, this would creep you out. This creeps me out as an adult, you know? And this is a very powerful tool that's used by the Watchtower to control their followers. I know many former witnesses that do not even think the religion is the truth, but they hold a very incredible fear of being killed at Armageddon by God because it's been instilled in them since childhood. Now, something to notice in each one of these images is who are the happy, lucky Jehovah's Witnesses that get to walk away from Armageddon? They're the obedient Jehovah's Witnesses. So to not get into too much of it, the basic understanding and belief of Jehovah's Witnesses is that when Armageddon comes, only the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses are going to survive Armageddon. So you want to be one of those faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. Everything else, all worldly things, including everybody on earth, except the Jehovah's Witnesses, will be destroyed at Armageddon. So you want to be one of these happy, you know, faithful Jehovah's Witnesses walking away from this hellfire, basically. And it's ironic for them not believing in hell. This looks a lot like hell. It's very powerful propaganda used to keep the Jehovah's Witness in line. Now, just to, just to kind of drive this fear home, you guys, because I think a lot of people watching may not understand the plight of the Jehovah's Witness or the ex-Jehovah's Witness who leaves. I, I know Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, that still have nightmares about Armageddon. They'll wake up in like a panic if there's a thunderstorm or if they hear a loud noise, they, they think Armageddon's coming. Now they know the watchtower, they, they know it's not true. We know it's not true. But the locks that stay on are real. And it takes a lot of deprogramming. It takes a lot of time to take the watchtower out of the witness, if you will. That just because they left doesn't mean that they automatically just, oh, leave that behind. It's the worst kind of mind control. And that's why it's called mind control. It doesn't just go away right away. So even witnesses that have been out for a long time still have issues with this particular fear. The next fear that I'm going to emphasize is the fear of being disfellowshipped. Now, this is a quote from the Watchtower, uh, one of many talking about this. We must hate the disfellowshipped person in the truest sense, which is to regard with extreme active aversion, to consider them as loathsome, odious, filthy, to detest. Remember earlier how we were talking about the water and the ink? Uh, if you're disfellowshipped from Je Jehovah's organization, you are looked at as a big bottle of ink. <laughs> Disfellowshipping is, I think, when a Jehovah's Witness gets dis disfellowshipped, not only are you going to die at Armageddon, to a Jehovah's Witness, you are for sure, if Armageddon comes, you're going to die. So they have that fear. And then they're shunned. Now, when I say shunned, I mean that in the strictest sense of the word. They are looked at like they're dead. You do not look at them. You do not talk to them. But in order to come back to the religion, you have to go to meetings. You have to show yourself worthy. And Again, we'll get into more about what that is and how that works in later videos, but they have a very strong fear of being disfellowshipped. And again, I am going to read a few more quotes just to uh, put into context how they be believe this and see this. All right, this one's from 2017. When someone who has seriously sinned does not repent and refuses to follow Jehovah's standards, 
he can no longer be a member of the congregation. He needs to be disfellowshipped. When someone is disfellowshipped, we have no more dealings with that person and we stop talking to him. Now they quote, see how they quote scripture for that? So they're saying, oh, this is in the Bible. Kind of like what I was saying before. The disfellowshipping arrangement protects Jehovah's name and the congregation. Remember the water and the ink. Disfellowshipping is also discipline that can help someone to repent so that he can return to Jehovah. Now, notice, return to Jehovah, return to the organization. You see how that works? Uh, two more quotes, just because. <laughs> Thus, disfellowshipping is what Jehovah's Witnesses appropriately call the expelling and subsequent shunning of such an unrepentant wrongdoer. That's from 1981 in the Watchtower. Next one from the Watchtower as well. A simple hello to someone can be the first step that develops into a conversation and maybe even a friendship. Would we want to take that first step with a disfellowshipped person? So you see how they put like this disdain towards talking to somebody who's disfellowshipped. You don't do it. I did it once at a convention and I did it on purpose. <laughs> they sit in the back at the conventions. They, they, there's an assigned seating for Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, so I'm allowed to talk to them. And there was one person who I went to talk to and he was genuinely shocked that I was talking to him. He's like, and they have to tell you they're disfellowship so that they don't affect your standing. And I told him, I'm like, I'm not a Jehovah's witness. What are you doing back here? What's going on? <laughs> I, I didn't want to make him feel awkward. And I didn't want to make it seem like I was a Jehovah's witness talking to a disfellowship person. So I did quietly hand them a note to the websites that I thought would be beneficial to him. Hopefully he looked at them. I don't know. It was years ago, but I, I go to the conventions to kind of plant little seeds and hope that even if just one of them wakes up, then it will be worth it. All right, the next fear that we're going to talk about is the fear of worldly people, people like you, people like me, because a devout Jehovah's Witness will never watch a video like this. To them, everybody who's not a Jehovah's Witness is worldly. Remember, black and white. The, the world to a Jehovah's Witness is constantly looked at as being bad. It's Satan's system. You cannot find happiness outside of the organization, just like a bad relationship. Remember the dynamic there? So if you leave, you'll never be as happy as you were with me. So what they do to kind of propel this and promote this is they share like constant stories of people uh, and how they lived before the organization and then how their lives changed after they found Jehovah's organization. A lot of people can find that churches can do this to an extent where it's about the church instead of finding Jesus directly, whole other story. And then what they also do is tell stories of witnesses, um, after say they've been disfellowshipped and then they're reinstated they tell stories about how awful and horrible and tragic their life was outside of the organization. So it's very effective. This is a very effective uh, way to keep witnesses away from worldly people. Uh, I, I, again, I kind of bring it back to the whole Rapunzel phenomenon, you know, it's just, you're in your tower. Oh man, it's such a good parallel, isn't it? Because you have Mother Gothel, who's like the organization, the tower, the watchtower. It's good. Oh man, okay. So you, you're up there in the tower. She's up there in the tower. And she's looking at, at the whole wide world that she's desperately afraid of because she's been told her whole life that you don't know what the world out there is just horrible and scary. And you know that song that she sings, Mother Knows Best? I swear. It's like the Watchtower Organization's theme song. <laughs> but that's what it's like. You're told, they're, they're told to fear everything outside of the organization with an intense, real fear, including the people. Uh, there's lots of quotes on this, but I'm going to quote this one. Uh, it's from the Watchtower 1987. Uh, and it says, uh, while some contact with worldly people is unavoidable at work, at school, and otherwise, we must be vi vigilant so as to keep from being sucked back into the death-dealing atmosphere of this world. Let the world go along in its way, reaping its bad fruitage in the form of broken homes, with illegitimate births, sexually transmitted diseases such as AIDS and countless other emotional and physical woes. So this is the picture that they paint. I would also say there's many different quotes and uh, teachings in general saying that the outside world is Satan's system. It's satanic, especially if you are from another religion. 
if I say I'm a born again Christian and that uh, the Holy Spirit dwells in me to them in their ears, they basically just heard that I'm demon possessed because they don't believe that the Holy Spirit of God can dwell in you. The Holy Spirit is something very different to a Jehovah's Witness. Again, we will get into more of their actual theology and doctrines later on. All right, a few more things, then I'm actually done. This is a lot longer than I thought it would be. My apologies, guys, but this is a very important topic, and I, I find it very relevant if you're going to talk to a Jehovah's Witness. Hopefully, it'll be useful and fruitful to you um, in your endeavors and learning about this religion. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is guilt. Uh, this is a very common emotion for Jehovah's Witnesses. It's a, it's a driving emotion. I'm sure a lot of people can understand the anxiety that goes along with guilt. A Jehovah's Witness never knows if they've done enough to please Jehovah, which is why they, it's like a circle. It's like, that's why they live in fear of Armageddon. They never know if they're doing enough. They overexert themselves trying to attain everlasting life. So a Jehovah's Witness will tell you that they believe in Jesus, that yes, we trust Jesus for our salvation, but the other side of the coin is they must join the organization and do the works of the organization completely to the best of their ability and never stop hamster wheel. And then they might survive Armageddon. A lot of Christians believe in once saved, always saved. Um, that once you have obtained salvation from God, once you are adopted as one of his children, you can't just be unadopted. You can't just not be a child anymore of God. Once saved, always saved. A lot of Christians believe that. Je Jehovah's Witness, the Watchtower, they do not. They are completely against that. You can lose your salvation in an instant. So to have that kind of fear over your head and guilt all the time is very difficult to handle for a Jehovah's Witness. There's a quote in the Examining the Scriptures Daily in 2012 I'm going to read. The ransom is totally undeserved, but by exercising faith in it, remember we talked about that before. So they say they have faith, but it's exercising faith. Very different. Millions today will have become friends of God with the hope of everlasting life on paradise earth. Becoming Jehovah's friends, however, is not an assurance that we will remain in such relationship with him. To escape God's future day of wrath, Armageddon, we must keep on showing our deep appreciation for the ransom paid by Jesus Christ. There's a lot more I could go on about. I, I do want to encourage you, if you want to learn more about um, mind control, how it works, this goes into way more detail. Uh, there's also lots of really good websites. Uh, there's also a lot of other websites out there. Again, I'm going to put it in the description of this video. Um, one last thing I kind of want to touch on very briefly before we end is something called cognitive dissonance. I know a lot of people may not know what this means, but this is actually a term that I can't remember who came up with it. It basically means to retain beliefs or perceptions that conflict with one another. So if a Jehovah's Witness knows, they, they know that everything that they believe is not true, one belief has to win out from the other. So like oil and water, you can't have both. So what we mentally do is one defaults over the other. That's one reason why it can be explained that a lot of people stay in high control religions or false religions that they know are false. It's because of cognitive dissonance. It's too mentally difficult to take it in so they don't i'm sure there's a lot of qualified people out there that could talk more about cognitive dissonance i am not a sociologist or a psychologist but that is a term that you're going to hear a lot when it comes to jehovah's witnesses and why they hold on to the beliefs they do as well as other people in high control religions <sighs> well that was a lot <laughs> i'm really glad you guys hung with me this far i really hope that this was beneficial for you uh the next series the next video i'm gonna make goes into their doctrine we start learning about what they believe and how to effectively witness to them so uh hopefully you'll stick around and you'll watch that one next week i really want people to understand that jehovah's witnesses are people they have feelings they have lives they walk amongst us i think it's something like one in every 300 people or so are Jehovah's Witnesses. They are all around us. And if we can understand their plight and maybe show them some love, maybe we can 
cause some really good healthy cognitive dissonance and and you know hopefully we can be somebody that god can use to show them the truth i'm very passionate about this topic and i really think that we should be praying for jehovah's witnesses and loving on them as best as we can so um Thank you guys again for watching and I'll as always be praying for you as well.